All right. Thank you all so much for being here. Let's get this started then. I don't think any more people are showing up. Anyway, uh, my name is Albert Lee. I'm a senior and currently going to Rennie High School. And this lecture will be really about the introduction to neuroscience. Oh, it will be a brief rundown of all the, uh, the basics, like the brains, the basic mechanism that's behind our everyday actions, what we think, what we do. And if you are really interested in the topic, there are always more to dive deep, deeper into. But this will be like a neuroscience 101, if you may. All right, let's first look at the brain. So the brain is really, as we all know, is the commander of the human body. As the integral part of the central nervous system, the brain is really the, the things that we think about when we are making decisions, doing actions and stuff. So what makes up of the brain? Seeing this picture here, it's a, it's a misagitation of what, what, the, what the human brain would look like. So if you cut it right down the middle, this is what we'll see. So let's look at a different part. This thing down in the down in the middle, it's called the brain stem. It is really to serve all the basic human function that we don't even think about when we're doing them. Things like breathing or digestion or circulations. These basic mechanisms run through the brain stem. And right this thing over here, it's the cerebellum. This is the motion control of the brain. It controls your body motions and it plays an integral part in your body memories. And this thing in the middle is the stimulus. It's, it's responsible for sorting data and feeding them to the cerebellum, which is this big thing right here that we're gonna dive deeper into. But in the stimulus, there's a there's this part that is pretty fam famous called the hypothalamus. This is famous for maintaining an organism's homeostasis. That is to essentially to uh, a mechanism to maintain everything inside of the body does the same to keep it steady. Things like the temperature, the pH level and stuff like that. And of course the big one, the, the big shell, all the uh, good stuff here, it's the cerebrum. Not to confuse with this part, that's called the cerebellum. The big part is it's called the cerebrum. It's it's a part that's important to the integ inter integration of data. And here is the perhaps a better look at uh, the cerebrum right here. And it's pretty common knowledge that it's composed of two hemispheres. And the two hemisphere is connected by a nervous tract called the corpus callosum. And the cerebrum can be further broken down into two different parts. And each part serves specific function that are very interesting. So the pink part right here, it's really the front. And as the name will be, it's called the frontal lobe. It is really the boss of the brain because a very famous part of, of our brain called the prefrontal cortex lays in this area. It's responsible, responsible for the executive function that's deciding what we do, what we don't do, and it controls the emotion and they serve a cognitive function. And look at this yellow part is the parietal lobe. This lobe is responsible for the sensation that is to take in the signal impulses that, that that's, feed, that's being fed in from the receptors in our fingers, for example. And the, green, and the green part right here, it's a temporal part, temporal lobe, and it is responsible for the language and memory. Once, one part of the temporal lobe will be the hippocampus. That is a part that's integral to, in, to encoding new memory, to memorize stuff, to put it simply. And this blue part right here will be the occipital lobe. And this, this function is quite simple, that it allows us to see stuff. It's responsible for the vision. And of course, the majority of the brain, almost all of it is composed of, a, of nervous tissue. They're densely packed in the brain, and there are two, two different types, 
types of it that we're concerned about. One type is the glial cells. And as you can see in the pictures, are the little, da little dots surrounding this big one, which is the other type called a neuron. So the glial cells that surround the neuron, they are really the majority of the nervous tissue. They compose of 90% of it. Their function may vary as their type vary. Some of their function include provide support to the neuron, provide nutrition, uh, give insulation, and help with signal transduction. So an example of glial cell will be estrogen. It's a type of glial cell that's present in the central nervous system. It is the most abundant type, and its job is to exchange materials and anchor neurons. Another type of glial cell will be the microglial, which helps with immune defense. And of course, there is the big one, the, ne the neuron. The neuron is usually what we think about when we're talking about nervous tissue, but actually it's only 10% of the nervous tissue. However, its job is the most important though. It responds to, this, it responds to stimuli and pass down the signal. One, fact, one fun fact about neuron is that it is very long lived. So you'll probably still have the same neuron that you're still born with compared to the other types of cells. For example, like your skin cells, they die every couple of days, couple of weeks, and they will divide itself to make up for that death. But neurons are different. Neurons are very, very long lived and they doesn't reproduce. They, they don't reproduce. And their structure are pretty complex too. So you have the cell body that contains all the cellular rec organelles like a normal cell. And then you have these extensions that are very important for it to have its purpose. And for example, this part is, is called the dendrites. Dendrites are surrounded around the cell body and they are responsible for picking up the signals. And, and another part is the axon, which is this long part right here. They are really for the conduction of the signal and just they transmit pulse to other cells. And there are three major types of neurons. The first one is called sensory neurons. They pick up signal from the receptor and they will send the signal towards the central nervous system and that is the brain. So sensory neurons send the signal to the brain. And another type is the motor neurons. They kind of pass the signal from the brain to the specific muscles in the body. And you have the interneuron, which is like a bridge between the two neurons and help transmit signal between the sensory and motor neuron. So here we can look at uh, a very famous mechanism for how signals or impulses are being passed down. For example, we, when your hand touches something, how does your brain know it? And that will be through a process called the action, action potential. To understand how it works, it's really quite simple. So at the resting state, the neuron has, it has a more negative charge inside because of, it, because of its chloride ions. And compared to the outside, which has a lot of uh, potassium ions or sodium ions that are very positive. The difference in the charge allows the two kind of uh, are being, are being held, held that way because of the membrane. And on those membrane, you have, little, you have different channels. And these channels regulates the crossing of those charges. And once those charges are being changed, a current is being produced to pass down that impulse. So a resting membrane potential is at roughly yeah. negative 70 millivolt. And a change, a channel across the membrane will, will open eventually to change that potential, as you can see in this graph right here. So initially, there will be a process called the graded potential, which, which are these little, which are little changes that will, that like minor stimulations that will slightly nudge the voltage difference across the membrane upwards. And once those graded potential reach a certain level, a threshold of negative 55 millivolts to be specific, and the action, action potential will begin. 
this, this stimulation eventually triggers the opening of ion channels, which allow large inflow exchange of ions. And that will significantly change the vo resting voltage of the membrane. So from the set, thresh from the set threshold, the opening of the voltage-gated ion channels will allow a big influx of ions from outside to the inside and from the inside to the outside. And it will eventually depolarize the, the axon to 40 millivolt. And eventually it will go through a process of repolarization that the ions will flow out with sodium potassium pump. And it's through a, even through a process called the hypo, hyperpolarization. And from this change in the voltage, a current will be produced and send down the signal from the, for example, the beginning of the axon, so axon to the end. And you realize that each action potential is the same. So, but every sensory input isn't. For example, the pain of uh, hitting yourself with a brick is different from like, getting hit by a car, for example. And that is being represented by the frequency of the action potential firing rather than the strength. And one thing that's interesting to mention is that the action potential can be passed down through the axon, is passed down through the axon, and is produced in the axon. But in order to, for it to be more efficient, there are little sheets of glial cell called myelins on, on them. Myelins essentially are installations. They are like the uh, the plat the, like the rubber tape of the of a wire. If you can imagine that, it's almost exactly the same. It keeps what's inside inside and keep what's outside outside. It doesn't allow that exchange and allows the impulse to be passed down more efficiently. So once uh, impulse uh, action potential is produced and from the beginning of the axon to the end of the axon, where does it go from there? It, well, it ideally has to be passed to another neuron and that is through, through the synapse. So a synapse is really a connection between one neuron to the other. And, there, and you, you can look at this graph here and the synaptic cleft, it's a space that is not occupied so you can see that the two neurons aren't directly connected, but they can still talk to each other. So there are two ways they can do that. One is through electrical synapse. In an electrical synapse, it's really a fast and a mass way to communicate. It communicates with a lot of cells at a very fast pace. But however, it is not very efficient to be a little bit counterintuitive because you don't, actually you don't want to be talking to a lot of neurons at the same time. So the electrical synapses are actually the, 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 the not, not so often used process. And compared to a chem chemical synapse, which are far more common, they are slower, but they are more precise. In the chemical synapse, neurotransmitters are being sent from the presynaptic pre neuron and these neurotransmitters are initially in these vesicles and they're gonna be, once the action potential hits the synapse, those neurotransmitters will be released and they'll be picked up by the ion channel receptors on the postsynaptic neurons. And after the receptor is, re is received, it will trigger a cascade of actions that will, tr that will transmit that chemical change into a essentially a, a, like a voltage change, uh, an impulse to be precise. And many may ask like, what happened to the action potential? What, I mean, what happened to the neurotransmitters at this, after it is being used? Well, the neurotransmitter goes through a process called a reuptake where they eventually will being sucked up. To, most of it at least will be, will be sucked up back into the presynaptic neuron. However, when that, when that does not happen, the, the, the result can be very serious. And actually that's the science behind, behind many drugs like cocaine, for example. Cocaine will block the, the, the receptors on the presynaptic neuron. 
So the neural transmitters will not be reuptaken to, into the presynaptic neuron. They will be, instead, they will be diffused in the, in the blood uh, into our system. And that can cause like um, almost a loss of homeostasis and cause a series of reactions. All right. So after learning all that process, how does how does the brain become the brain? In, essentially, it's another important question. So in the early embryonic development, there will be three layers: the, the outer, the middle, and the inner. The nerve cells are triggered from the signal sent from sent from the outer to make this middle layer of the embryonic cell to become nerve cells. And subsequent signaling will put the cells into specific types. And cell types are determined from the distance of the signaling molecule. And that will be the formation and in induction of the nerve cells. The next process is the proliferation. In, and in the brain, a, a small pool of stem cells will become neurons. Those neurons will undergo divisions and their, their growth will be very rapid. So when they're going through the, when they're dividing after the division, there will be a lot of them. So there, are, so there will only be a very few number of stem cells that will be left. So if you got a very, that means that if you get a very serious injury in your brain, there will like be likely no regeneration compared to if you get a cut on your hand, for example, like it will heal, but because there's not a lot of stem cells left in, the, in your brain, it won't if you injure your brain. So that's why brain injuries are very serious. Oh, wait, on this slide. The next stage will be the migration. So that's after the nerve cells are being mass produced in the process of proliferation they will essentially be sent to the specific area of the, of the brain to form the shape of the brain as we know it. It happens after three to four weeks after an infant is conceived. And after seven weeks in the mother's womb, the hemisphere will appear on the infant, on the baby. In the process of migration, there will be the guidance and that's provided through a glial cell called a red, radial gl glial. They are almost like the scaffolding. They allows the different nervous cells to inch along it until it, they reaches their ultimate decision, uh, ultimate position. And the next step is making connection. Neurons essentially, after they are being placed, they have to connect with each other and to allow synapses to take place essentially. So the dendrites will be connected through the axons and the axons will be extended through, a process, through the extension of, of the thing called the growth cone. They, are, well, they will be guided to their proper place and because the growth, growth cone will be, sense, will be are sens very sensitive to the environment. Through that process, they will know when, when they're in the, in the right place and they will stop. And after that, the synapse will form through the synaptic function. Myelination, essentially myelin will be started growing on axons and that process will allow the, uh, the action potential to be more efficient. And through this process, the baby will be starting to grow. Uh, the, the last step actually is a process called parent back. After all the rapid growth and the formation of the, of the brain, <clears throat> The brain, the baby itself, actually takes a step back. The growth of the neural network will be paired back after its initial burst almost. As a fun fact, only one half of the neuron being produced initially in the baby will survive. They go through a process called ap aptosis, where neurons will control, essentially kill themselves. And it occurs when a neuron is not getting enough chemical, chemical factors called a tropic factor. Another way of pairing back is the pruning of excess connections. 
the synaptic connections will be cut because they're essentially not being used frequently enough. A, a synapse with less activity will be lost eventually. And just as a human grow in this process that's showing the pictures, our brain also goes through these changes. The first few years are the stages that our brain grow very rapidly through the mechanism that I mentioned in the last slide. And experience is a very important factor in the, in the process of brain growth. Human, human beings are really not as developed, uh, human, humans brain are really not as developed at birth as compared to some other mammals. And after birth, a critical period presents itself where the input of motor, sensory, and emotions will shape the brain. Although, and other than the environmental factors, obviously gene also play a very important factors in the development of the brain in early stages. And going to the ad adolescence, which is the teenage years, and the more complex function of the brain will be developed. In this process, in this stage, more synaptic pruning appears. That is, more synapse will be, will be dying. And through a process called competitive elimination, where the more used synapse will, be, will, will survive and the lesser used will not. And the connections between neurons are improved. The extension of the dendrite branch will occur. And just essentially, as a children, as a teenagers, they can, we can learn a lot better. And the, a thing called the white matter in the brain will also grow. And the, the corpus callosum, if you can recall, it's a connection between the hemisphere will also grow. And this is what is to believe to lead to the increase in learning capacity during those years. And going into adulthood, we can make a little comparison with adolescent years, and that's very interesting. In the teenage year, the myelination is more at the visual, the audio, and the part that's controlling our movement of the, of the body. And that is because during teenage years, those sensations, those input are the most crucial, while compared to a human in their 30s, where the myelinations are in the frontal and parietal part of their brain. In those parts, uh, a human's decision of a human's ability of making decisions and developing a memory and to essentially make decisions will be improved, improved their cognitive functions in general. And that's why, you know, adults say they are better decision makers than us. There's actually science behind that. And of course, the brain, like, like the rest of our body will age, its structure will change. The brain volume will start to decline and it really begins at around a human's 40s. Neurons will shrink, the, uh, the dendrites number will decrease and they will retract themselves. And through this process, really the dendrite, they will lose their dend dendro spine. And that is very important to help them serve their proper functions. And through, the react, through this process, the brain will be, become less and less developed and cognitive function, its prefrontal cortex and its working memory will decrease. And that is the process, process of brain aging. All right, so that will be the end of the presentation. I would like to thank you so much for your attention during this process and uh, just know that it is really the tip of iceberg of learning the brain. Uh, if you're very interested, of course, you can take more classes like this in, in high school in the future. And it, it is always, always good to know, at least for me, to, to know what's going on in your brain as you do your daily stuff. I, I always find that very interesting. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. Bye.